Today, Stewardship of Influence, last full class. Next week, we will, the first uh, section, we will probably do sort of call to action in terms of summing up, in other words. And then the final exam, you have all the notes, and if you lose your notes or your printer's not working, all of that stuff is available online. And in fact, if your printer's not working, there are more copies of the, uh, the notes from this class back there. A couple people have already told me that are in the philosophy class, their printers aren't working, I will have copies of those notes for you tomorrow, okay? Um, Stewardship, we, a couple of slides that we always start with. Um, stewardship is the process of conducting, supervising, or managing something, especially to be responsible for manage, management of something entrusted to someone else. A steward is someone who cares for something that belongs to someone else. As stewards, we're made by God, we belong to Him. In fact, everything is made by God. Everything belongs to Him. And He has entrusted us with caring for those things for Him. So a Christian steward, uh, well, when we talk about Christian stewardship, it means every aspect of our lives. I, I use the term whole life stewardship. Everything we are, everything we have, everything we say and do, we have a responsibility as Christians especially to be stewards of those things as God's representatives here. Okay. Um, so that's what this class has been all about. If you haven't figured that out before now, then your teacher really messed up. Um, so. <laughs> So we'll see. Today we want to talk about stewardship of influence. So we start out with the question, what is influence? Good dictionary definition would be influence is the action or process of producing effects on the actions, behavior, opinions, etc. of another or others. Influence means that we exert some, whether anything from pressure to just example, um, on other people so that they end up changing in some way, all right? Now, um, plainly an obvious manifestation of influence is evangelism. That's the most obvious one. And because we are told that we are to be evangelists, then as Christians we plainly are called to be positive influences on others. Jesus' last words before his ascension in Matthew 28, All authority in heaven and earth are given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and evangelize. Go and influence people to believe in me. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So, all of us are called to be influencers for Christ. Evangelism being the most pointed example. And it's important to recognize that this directive is given to all of us, not just those people in positions of ministry or leadership. You don't have to be the pastor of a church or the head of a Christian parachurch organization or in any other way a, a professional Christian in order to still have the responsibility to be an influencer for Christ in whatever sphere of influence you have. Whether it's your family, your friends, your acquaintances, your social circles, all of us have the ability, in fact it's going to happen whether you intend for it to or not, all of us will be influencers to those around us. So whether it's intentional or not, as Christians we are told, we are supposed to be intentional about it. We're supposed to be thoughtful about how we're going to influence and be careful about how it is we seek to influence other people. It's been said very truthfully, there are only two things that will last forever. Scripture says that the Word of God is eternal, and the other thing that's eternal are the souls of human beings. When we say the Word of God, we mean God Himself. And then He can, you know, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. But the heaven and the earth that, we, that exist now will go away. Everything that exists will burn. Everything will be destroyed and a new earth will replace it. But the only thing that exists now in our realm that will always be are people. Souls do not ever die. Um, C.S. Lewis, in one of his um, most famous and most wonderful sermons, and it actually was a sermon called The Weight of Glory. There's a, a small book called The Weight of Glory now that has this, this sermon essay and a couple of others in it. We actually, when I went to the C.S. Lewis conference in Cambridge and Oxford, in Oxford, we met at the church where Lewis delivered this sermon. Um, and 
one of the things that was kind of cool, um, there's a, an actor who does, he actually has recorded a lot of extraordinary voices, he's recorded scripture, you know, um, on CDs for things, but he also does performances. Well, he had memorized all of the Sermon on the Way of Glory, and he delivered it from the same pulpit that Lewis had delivered it from. So, but in the Way of Glory, toward the end of it, Lewis says this, there are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilization, these are mortal, and their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. Every human being will live forever. What he means by immortal horrors or everlasting splendors, those who choose against God will be the property of Satan. Those who choose for God will live forever as immortal splendors. So when we talk about influencing people, the responsibility is an extraordinary one because every person will never stop existing in terms of what that person really is, their soul. And so we have that responsibility. And as I said earlier, evangelism plainly is influencing. And that means uh, being a Christian example, camp campaigning for moral causes, almost everything that you do that is visible or audible or legible is an effort to influence. My undergraduate degree is in communication theory. It's in communication, but we call it communication theory not, so you don't mistake it for radio or something. It's not, it's not that kind of communication. But in communication theory, one of the pieces I wrote in my uh, undergraduate was that all communication is an effort to convince. Convince is another word for influence, basically. No matter what you communicate, no matter how you do it, whether you speak, whether you write, whether you simply are seen, it is, in one way or another, an influence. So much better to be aware of that and intentional about it, especially as Christians. Because in effect, when we talk about the stewardship of influence, what we're really saying is the stewardship of relationships. This means every relationship you have, or every relationship you can have, or will have, you have a responsibility for making sure that that relationship is reflective of how Christ wants you to be involved in that relationship. So the stewardship of influence is the stewardship of relationships. Okay, is that fair? Any questions, Pam? Um, you mentioned something about the soul being always eternal, going yes. on and on. So if the person goes to hell, his soul is in hell with the, Satan for eternity. Until Satan is destroyed? No, forever. The doctrine of Scripture says that uh, the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his demons is forever. Now, there are all sorts of things about, well, you know, how can that be loving or how can that be just or whatever. We simply don't have the answers to those questions. Well, what I was saying is, is it not that eventually God will take Satan off the out of the equation? Well, he will take Satan out of a position of influence us. When Jesus, Jesus said, uh, the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his demons. In other words, there will be one place where God's presence will not be. And that will be hell. I mean, that's the definition of it, pretty much. That the place where God's presence is not. And as, as again quoting Lewis, Lewis said that in the end, God will give all people what they want. Those who choose God and want to be with Him will be with Him. Those who say, I don't want God, I don't want to be with Him, God will give them what they ask for. And the only place where God's presence will not be is in the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his demons, in the presence of Satan and his demons. Okay? This is why this is a big deal. Now, there is much about this we don't know. There are some people of, of um, you know, we're not un universalists. We don't believe, Scripture does not allow us to believe, that all people will be saved. Either up front or, you know, that we, you know, we all, when the Lord comes back, He goes, Oh, guys, I wasn't really serious about all that, you're all okay. No, there's too much about it. Um, there are some who believe that after a period of time, that God in His great mercy and love has a, you know, has a plan B, that He will do something about that later. But there's certainly no scriptural reference to that. We can't count on that. All that we do know is that 
At the point of our deaths, it is appointed unto man once to die, Scripture says, and after that, the judgment. And the judgment is, the first part of the judgment is those who have accepted Jesus Christ and whose names are in the book of life will be in heaven with him for eternity. Those who have rejected and who have not, whose names are not the book of life, therefore, will be condemned with Satan. They will go to the only place where God's presence is not. And that's because they chose that. Not because God, you know, is ticked off and he's going to nuke them in the end. It's because that's what they selected. Aren't there, is there a religion that only says that the remnant is going and not everyone? Well, there's Mormons say that. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses say that. Well, the problem is, for instance, that, that Jehovah's Witnesses, when they started, when the guy who started Jehovah's Witnesses, he said there would only be 144,000. Pulling that number out of Revelation. Well, then when they finally got, when they got more than 144,000 members <laughs> donating to the church, they decided, well, let's reinterpret that. Okay? Um, and so, yeah, there's, there are some who say there's only, it's only the remnant. But the remnant, as we define it, as we understand it, are those who maintain faith in Christ. All of those. Marvin, did you have something? I was just going to say that's their choice, that I don't want to believe in God, I'm not going to serve God, and they're not, they're not going to change their minds. Now, if, if he was a God that, I'm going to say, put enough punishment and pressure on them, that they would say, okay, then I'll believe, okay, I'll follow. You know, they say, man convinced against his will, they son convinced still. You no. can't, can't change their mind. That's yep. what they are, that's what they are. Right. And the paradox for us, the thing is that we, we know because of what he's done for us, that God is a good and loving and merciful God. And yet, he is also a holy and righteous God whose judgment is right. And this is how he is presented to, you know, this is how salvation and damnation is presented to us in Scripture. That those who have accepted Christ will be saved for eternity. Those who have rejected Christ will be damned for eternity. And we do know, and I think that even Romans, the early part of Romans sort of addresses this, People always say, well, what about the people who never really heard about Jesus, who never had a chance? God is not going to condemn, in the same way that God does, does not condemn infants that die, <coughs> um, no matter the fact that there have been some Catholic theologians over the years who have said that he did, if they weren't baptized. Um, we do not believe he does, in the same way we do not believe that God will hold someone accountable for their sins if they were never given any reasonable chance to make a decision about that. Now, how he will do that, we don't know. Well, doesn't uh, Romans say, uh, I believe it's in the uh, first chapter of Romans, that God has made himself known uh, through his creation so that no one is... Uh, was Without saved. witness, yeah. Yep. Exactly, and that's what I was referring to. Yes. You know, the indication is that even if they maybe never heard about Jesus, there's enough evidence that all people have experienced that there is a God, that if, they have, if they've accepted that and done the best they could to be consistent in their lives with that, then God, God takes that into account. That's really everything we can say about that. Okay. Um, and, and it may be that he then gives them an opportunity to hear about Jesus. We don't know, because we're going to talk a little bit later that it is only by Christ that salvation comes. So, okay, we're getting into all sorts of stuff here. Maybe we will go two hours. Um, <laughs> so when we talk about stewardship of influence, I think we can identify three primary objectives that are involved in the stewardship of Christian influence, right? Um, first, influencing people to know the one true God. Now, this is, this is a first step. These things are almost cumulative, all right? The fact is that these days, Western culture tends either to not want to talk about um, there being one, the existence of God, or else they don't acknowledge the existence of God, because if, we, if they uh, accept that there is one true God, then that means that there are people who believe in false gods and people in misguided, mushy-headed kind of, you know, modern morality don't like the idea that anybody can be wrong. Everybody's right. Nobody's wrong. You can't say someone is wrong. I've told you that story about a woman in my classes, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, when I was teaching in Seattle, I taught a class called World Religions and then I taught a class called False Religions. World Religions, I dealt with the major religions and I did so respectfully, but the context was to say, here's how these differ from Christianity and why we believe Christianity is correct. Well, then when I got to false religions, a woman who had been coming to my class for some time came up to me after the second regular class, and when I said false religions, I'm talking about Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christian science, etc. Okay. 
candidates. Some of the ones that, that fairly commonly are called cults, and almost all of them pseudo-Christian. I mean, they started from Christianity and then, you know, took a sharp turn. Um, well, again, I, I deal with those things respectfully, I believe, because my, my feeling is that in a pluralistic society, everyone has a right to believe and to profess what they wish. I'm not saying they don't. And I'm not saying that we believe Christianity is right because aren't we good. It's not because we are good or better than anybody else. It is simply because we have accepted the mercy God extends to us. It is an act of God, not an act of us. And in fact, I love the statement that, that telling someone about Jesus is simply one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Well, this woman comes up to me after second or third class in this, this false religions class, of course, and she said, you know, I think it would be great if you would invite the people from these different groups to come and talk about their religion. And I said, well, I really have two problems with that. One is I have an obligation as an elder of the University of Presbyterian Church where I was teaching this to make sure that we are, you know, that we are representing the faith that they represent. You know, I have, I have a sort of fiduciary responsibility here. But the biggest reason why I wouldn't want to do that is because I would be reluctant to have somebody come from one of these groups and talk about what they believe when the whole point of my class is, is saying why we believe they're wrong. And she sort of blanched and she said, what do you mean you think they're wrong? And I said, well, I'm sure they're well-intentioned and they absolutely have a right to believe what they want to believe, but I think they're mistaken in those beliefs. She said, you can't say they're wrong. And I said, actually, I can. And she said, well, surely the pastors of this church wouldn't say they were wrong. Um, they have ten ordained people on staff and I had gone to seminary with four of them. Um, and I said, actually, there are all the ministers in this church, and I'm quite sure that they would say they were wrong. She said, but you can't say that. And I said, please understand. I'm not saying they don't have a right to believe what they want. We live in a pluralistic world, again. But they, everybody can't be right. In fact, you're only just read, I had a, there's a wonderful couple that attends our church. And I got a message from them uh, the other day, and we love them to death, and they're really wonderful. I got a message, and they had sent me a slideshow about a guy who was talking to the Dalai Lama. He asked the Dalai Lama in a conversation, what is the best religion, or the most correct religion, or the right, or whatever yes, it was. The best religion, I think is what it was. And the Dalai Lama, they had a fairly extensive response from him, saying the best religion is the one that brings you closer to God, the one that works for you, the one that you know makes you a better person, etc., etc. And she said, that's sort of where we're coming from. And I wrote back, long explanation, and I said, you know, there's a part of me that wants to be able to say the same thing. There really is. Out of a sense of fairness and generosity and, you know, and, and, you know, brotherhood of man and all that. But I can't say that because that can't be true. All religions aren't the same. All religions can't be right. And I said, first we need to recognize that there's a tendency and it's reflected in the slideshow they sent me, um, to think that the point of a religion, or the thing that defines a religion, is how it makes you feel, or what it does for you. And I said, in fact, religions aren't defined, that may be a symptom, but the religions aren't defined by how they make you feel, whether you, whether you feel better about God or yourself or whatever. Religions are defined by the truth claims they make. Every religion has their own truth claims that are really the terms that define that religion. Well, you don't mind me going into all this. Is this okay? And I said, for instance, Judaism believes that there is one God and he has uniquely selected the Jewish people as his own. Um, Christianity believes there's one God, but that God is a triune God, three persons in one, and that the second person of that trinity came to earth in order to save us from our sins. Islam believes there is one God. Jesus was not divine. He was simply a prophet and not the most important prophet. Muhammad was the most important prophet. And, and Islam says that Jews and Christians have gotten it wrong. They've gone way, way wrong afield. And obviously, Judaism and Islam both reject the Christian claim that God is a triune God and that Jesus was divine. The Hindu faith believes in literally millions of gods. Uh, Buddhism does not profess God at all. There is no belief in God in Buddhism. You know, later versions of it, Theravada Buddhism later tried to almost deify Buddha, which I'm sure just still takes him off. Um, wherever he is. You know, animism is an effort to try to keep, to satisfy the spirits so that they don't harm you, um, and on and on. And I said, all of these truth claims of these religions 
not only are not the same, they are contradictory to one another. And therefore, they cannot all be right. If I say that Jesus is the Son of God, and someone else says, no, he isn't, that person has a right to say that, and I would defend their right to say that, but we can't both be right. You guys who are in philosophy, you remember the yes. law of non-contradiction. Yes. Something cannot both be and not be. Something can both be, <coughs> be true and not be true in the same way at the same time. That's one of the fundamental laws of thought. And I said, so for those reasons, in a, in a technical sense, it is not logically, rationally possible to believe all religions are the same. Okay. And so we have to decide which religion's truth claims do we believe are correct, or at least closest to correct. For me, as I said in my message, for me, that is Christianity. And Orthodox, with a small O, not, not Eastern Orthodoxy, but an Orthodox and Evangelical version of Christianity, to me, is more correct than its truth claims. Okay? So, when people say, well, you know, if we accept one God, then that's not fair because that, <laughs> that you know, excludes everybody else. It's not rational to say everybody can be right. Pam? I'm sorry, um, just to back up for just a second. Sure. Does Scientology believe in God? Uh, who knows what Scientology okay. really believes? I know. Um, Scientology is more of a self-help thing. Okay. It's an effort to, the, the principle behind Scientology is that everyone has this, these negative vibes they've absorbed called engrams, that you've had negative influences and they've scarred you and so the whole goal is to buy their machine for $499 or whatever it is and to go through a whole series of counseling sessions that will allow you to get rid of these engrams so that you can be what they call clear, meaning you don't have any negative stuff in you anymore. Carolyn and I were once in a fair and we were walked by a Scientology booth and this guy said, Hi, can I talk to you about Scientology? And Carolyn said, I'm clear. <laughs> it was perfect. That's it was great. perfect. I'm clear. Yeah. <laughs> um, Excellent. So yeah, it's more self-help. And in fact, Buddhism, the weird part about this, and I said this, I have great respect for the Dalai Lama as a, as a figure for peace and all sorts of things, but I don't agree with his religious beliefs. And the weird part is, when the Dalai Lama said in this, these slides that they sent to us that um, whichever religion works for you, basically, and whichever religion makes you feel you've gotten closer to God or makes you a better person, whatever, the idea of making you a better person is completely consistent with Buddhism because Buddhism is a system uh, that is supposed to, to rid a human being of suffering by ridding us of, of craving. You know, Buddha's conclusion is that there is pain in life, but the reason there's pain in life is because we want stuff, and so get rid of wanting and then you won't have suffering, and that's the goal of Buddhism. There is no doctrine of God in Buddhism. And I said, so the idea that the Dalai Lama would say, whichever one you know, works for you, is very consistent with Buddhism. The fact that he said, whichever one brings you closer to God, is not consistent with Buddhism, because Buddhism does not claim God. So I don't know where he was coming from on that day. Um, but Scientology, I think, is similar, except they have a very complicated, very long, very expensive process that you have to go to to get rid of those engrams so that you can be declared. Okay, is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yes, Joan? Actually, when the Dalai Lama said, whatever religion brings you closer to God, he was right on, because that would be Christianity. <laughs> oh, I agree. I agree with that. In fact, and I said in my message to those folks that, that I believe that, you know, the reason why I feel I need to tell people about Jesus is for their own sake. Because Jesus said, I come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And that, you know, my belief is that Christianity is not only for eternity a solution, but it is the right answer that people are looking for now in this life as well. So I agree, you're right. Marvin? Well, he said that to be liked as well. You know, uh, he doesn't want to reject anyone, and maybe some of you will come and follow my, my particular way. We are tempted to do the same thing. We want yeah. people to like us and say, well, you're okay, you're okay, we're all okay. Uh, it's, it's expensive to say you're wrong. <laughs> right. I'm okay, you're okay, you know, but that's okay. You're you're wrong. The, the change in that was, I'm not okay, you're not okay, but that's okay. I mean, we can be, we can be okay. You know, yes. I wonder where their religion goes when there will be no more Dalai Lama. He said he's it. Oh, really? It's it. I haven't heard that. He will not have it. He said that he's the last one. Oh, wow. Okay. That's it. That would be interesting. Okay. Um, 
We've got to have all sorts of stuff there. But our Christian faith demands belief in one God. And that's sort of where we start. Again, in our secularized society, it's become increasingly popular to say either there isn't a God or there's many different ways to God. And some of, some of that's even institutionalized. The Baha'i faith says there are as many roots to God you know, as there are people. And that all, you know, the, the, the symbol of Baha'i, one of their symbols, is a wheel. One of them is a hand. And they say that all religions are fingers of the hand of God. I'm sorry, but that's senseless. There's no, there's no rational meaning behind that. It sounds good. Okay, you can make cool logos out of it, but it doesn't make any sense. Now again, they have a right to believe that, to testify to it, to whatever, and I would defend that. But at the same time, I have to say that it's simply mush-mindedness to say that everybody can be right. You, you haven't thought about it, at least not in the right way if you think that's possible. Okay, so, we believe, another reason I should say why people don't like the idea that there's one God, and this came out in our philosophy book by some, some uh, atheistic writer, is that if there was one God, then that means I'm accountable. Yes. And people don't like that either. If there is one God and he has standards, and I don't meet those standards, then I'm answerable for it. And who wants, you know, none of us like that idea. But the fact that it's true, we can't change that just because we don't like it. We believe that God is the God of Bible. the Bible, who is represented in the Bible, has revealed himself in Jesus Christ first and in the written word. We believe he is the creator and Lord of all. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He means everything. We believe he is the eternal triune God. We are made in his image. I think you all have all been in the classes where I've said that it was a revelation to me one time when I realized that when we say we're made in God's image, that itself is a reflection of the Trinity. Because as human beings, we have a controlling mind, we have a physical body, carne, meat, and we have a spirit that responds to things that are not cognitive, that are not of the rational world. Things like love and loyalty and honor, justice, these are not things that have, have a cognitive quantity, but rather there's some other part of us that respond to that. And so in a very real way, I believe that we are made in the image of God and that we are made as a trinity. Every one of us has all three of those pieces that I believe reflect God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay? Make sense? So he is the eternal triune God. He is the one and only Savior of humankind. For God so loved the world, most popular verse of Scripture, John 3.16, that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but everlasting, but have everlasting life. Again, yeah, we're not universalists. Um, the universalists believe everybody gets saved, and the Unitarian Universalists, or UUs, as they're sometimes called, which I call the Church of My Father, but the universe, <laughs> Unitarian Universalists believe that don't believe that Jesus was divine, and that everybody's going to get saved. And I've told you there was a school that I used to drive by. Um, when I was in seminary in Pasadena, California, and, it, and I, I heard it was a Christian school, and I drove by, and they had this beautifully carved wooden sign. I mean, the letters were engraved on this wooden um, sign. And it read, For God so loved the world that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Did you hear it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They left a few things out. They took out that he gave his only begotten son, son. because as Unitarians, they don't believe in the divinity of Jesus. In fact, the Unitarians have a Bible called the Dartmouth Bible, which has, they have simply removed anything that could be seen as a reference to the Trinity. I, I'm not picking on them, but we do need to understand why we disagree with some of those things. Um, I am picking on them, okay? But not in a way that I'm saying that they don't have a right to that. I'm just saying we need to be clear that that is not consistent with what we do. Okay? So, first, we have a... a a responsibility as stewards of Christian influence that we influence people to know the one true God. But the one and only Savior of humankind, the Father, sent the Son on a mission. Our second responsibility within our Christian influence is to influence people to believe in and follow Jesus Christ. This is where it comes, you know, the first step in a conversation with a lot of people is to say, I believe in God. I mean, that's a big enough step. I don't believe in many gods, I believe in one God. But then we have to be aware of the fact that our belief is not just in God, our belief is in the second person of the Trinity of God, which is Jesus Christ. Because our faith not only says there's one God, it tells us that there is only one way to know God. 
and that is in Jesus Christ. Not because we're arrogant or narrow-minded, not because we think aren't we good, somehow better than everybody else, but because our faith is centered in Jesus as uniquely the way, the truth, and the life. John 4, and I'll give you three verses here that, that are the verses that give us not just the license, but give us the requirement that we acknowledge that Jesus is uniquely the way to God. Jesus answered, John 14, 6 and 7, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The language is unequivocal there. You can't say the translation is wrong. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, all things have been committed to me by, by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. We do not get to God the Father except through Jesus. A third verse that I don't have up here, and because I'd already prepared the slides and then realized I'd left one out, is Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12. Those three passages are unequivocal in saying that Jesus is the way, there is no other way. And again, part of me wishes that weren't true. Part of me wishes, you know, if you're really sincere in what you believe, then you'll be fine. But that is not our faith. If you want to believe that, you need to look somewhere else, because that's not Christianity. But again, we, we believe that not in a self-righteous domineering, aren't we good and aren't you bad kind of way, but a way of saying, praise God that he has blessed us with that understanding, and we want to take as many people with us as we can. Again, out of, out of concern for their well-being, both in this life and in the life to come. Um, our core message, the focus of our influence, is Jesus Christ as the only way to God and the only way to eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Can't leave that part out. That whosoever would believe in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And so, our influence is an evangelistic influence. It is to share not only belief in God, the one true God, but also belief in Jesus Christ as His Son. To be a follower of His, and then to be a disciple of His. Which brings us to the third uh, aspect of our influence, influencing people to live a normal and productive Christian life. The reason normal is in quotes there. Are you familiar with Watchman Nee? Yes. Watchman Nee was a Chinese Christian um, leader, a writer who was martyred in China in 1972. Watchman Nee urged believers to live what he called the normal Christian life. And his point here is that this is not exceptional. This should be the norm in our Christian lives. And it meant one that is spiritually whole and balanced. So we profess that there is one true God. That's the first stage of our influence. We profess that there is one way to God, which is through the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. And then we say, as we have accepted Christ, we then have a way we should live and to influence in that way. Um, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, some people... There are places in Scripture like the passage that said, a religion that God honors is this, to care for orphans and widows and to prevent yourself from being polluted by the world. Some people have taken passages like that and, and interpreted this meaning we need to get completely out of contact with the world. That's how you keep from being polluted. That's wrong. Yes, we are not supposed to be polluted by the world. We're not supposed to have the same values as them. We're not supposed to be drawn in to the evil and the sickness and the sin that the world is so prone to, and that we're so prone to if we allow ourselves to. But we can't separate ourselves from the world. We can't become a, you know, a Christian community behind high walls with barbed wire tops thinking we're going to be okay, because if you do that, 
How are you salt and light to the world? You cannot be salt and light if you never get close enough to unbelievers for them to taste you and see you. And recognize that salt and light have characteristics. Salt keeps things from going bad. It is a preservative. And we are supposed to be the preservative that influences the world for Jesus. Light brings all things out into the open. It illuminates all things. We are just supposed to be the light of the world. We are supposed to, by the power and grace of Christ, to illuminate as we reflect His light. The salt and light thing is sort of a summing up of what it means for us to be influential in terms of people's lives. Salt so also um, brings out flavor and uh, enjoyment of a, a, a meal or a product. Right. And so our Christianity brings out in us the great joy that there is in being a Christian and, and living the Christian life. Right. And that people will say to you, you're different. Well, yeah, I yeah, have, and it's been great. Yeah. Um, C.S. Lewis said, you know, there's no end of quoting C.S. Lewis. C.S. Yeah. Lewis said that joy is the unique province of Christians. Mm -hmm. Because we have, we have an access to joy, an ability to experience and to express joy that nobody else has because we are tied into the source of our joy. Okay? So, in the, as we influence people to live normal, as Watchman Nee called normal, that means balanced and spiritual. Um, productive Christian life, we need to influence how others think, we need to influence how others feel, we need to influence how others speak, we need to influence how others act. And the way we do that is by being very aware and intentional about how we think and feel and speak and act. Because if we aren't aware of how we are living in and remember, you, you're an influence whether you mean to or not, then we certainly aren't going to be able to pass that on to anyone else. Um, Philippians 4.8, finally, brothers, for the first part, how we think. We as Christians are called on to think deeply, clearly, positively. We need to have a right understanding of God, of ourselves, of our Christian lives. This is kind of the premise behind the very difficult class that I'm teaching on Fridays, Philosophical theology, because the one part of that that we often, of this, that we often have failed at, that the Christian church has failed miserably at for the last 150 years, 100 or so years, is that we have stopped thinking. We have abdicated the mental side of our persons to the secular world. And we've gotten our spiritual fannies kicked because of it in terms of what is influential in the world. Philippians 4 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And that includes thinking about why it is we believe that what we believe about God is true. In a scriptural sense, of course, but also in an intellectual, rational, philosophical sense. Those of you who are in the class, is that the sense you get? That that's why we're doing that? Okay, so first, we need to be aware of how we think and how we influence other people's thoughts. Secondly, we need to be aware of how others feel and how, how we act affects that. Everybody wants to be affirmed and appreciated. Everybody. And everybody you meet, you have an opportunity either to make them feel better or even to make them feel worse. Which do you do? How do you influence them? I know a lot of people who have become Christians because they met somebody, in fact, myself, to a great extent. Um, not to a great extent, myself. Because I met somebody and said, and I said, I want to be like them. I want to have what they have. And it started as a feeling. They made me feel appreciated, good, positive, affirmed. People want to be like that. So we can make a difference in influencing how they feel, and in that way, ministering them, ministering Jesus to them. Sorry, yes? Uh, just a comment. The, uh, before I was a believer, the first Bible study I ever went to, uh, there were probably about 20 women and one woman leading. 
And when I walked in, I was loved. And these women uh, had such a joy. I was a happy person, but the joy was unmistakable. And I was so drawn to that. Uh, and they just loved me because I was there. And that just drew me in. And then once I heard the gospel, I mean, I was a pushover then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't want that? Yes. Right? Um, my friend Tim Waits, who was really a searcher, this was in college. And actually, the year after college, I stuck around in the house that I lived in, and Tim was a roommate. Became the, the center point for our Christian fellowship. We would meet there on Friday nights and everything. Um, well, Tim was, he'd been going to the Baha'i Fellowship, he visited various other religious groups on campus, etc. And finally one time, and, but he would come to our fellowship meetings and sing out loud and pay close attention, and he, you know, he was a dear friend, we loved him, he was a roommate, a friend, and, and we, everybody really did love him, he was a very lovable guy. Well, finally one time Tim sat down with me, he said, you know, I visited a lot of these groups. And he said, some of them just don't make any sense. For instance, the Baha'i tell me that I'm basically a good person. You know, that's one of the principles behind is people are good. And Tim said, you know, if I'm basically good, why is it so hard to be good and so easy to be bad? <laughs> you know, so there were some doctrinal things. He saw Christianity as being more consistently true with what he understood. But he said, but I come here, and even because I'm, I'm not a Christian, you all accept me, and you love me, and you make me part of everything you're doing. You make me feel good about myself and about being part of this extended family. And he said, what else is anybody really looking for? From that, he met Jesus and became a pastor. Okay. Um, influencing how others speak. First, we have to be careful how we speak. That's both how we speak to other people in terms of affirming them, making them feel appreciated, uh, causing them to feel in good ways. But we, we can also speak negatively. I mean, James, the book of James talks a lot about the horrendous power of the tongue and how hard it is to control the tongue, how we start forest fires you know, metaphorically speaking, with our tongues um, and the dangers of that. How we speak will be perceived by others and will eventually influence how they speak. And then finally, how we act. Paul, the Apostle Paul, could say, and this is fairly late in his ministry, he could say, follow my example, as I follow the example of Christ. Can we say that? Based upon how we act, how we live our lives? Follow my example. Be like me. That scares me. Follow the way I am mostly, I'm okay with it. That's not what Paul said. Okay. We always have, we all have our down times. Okay. So, those three influence people to understand there is one true God, influence them to see that there is the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and through Him we come to God, and then influence them to live a normal, which means balanced and spiritual Christian life, and productive Christian life. Okay? Now, with that context, we Christians are blessed with many, 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 with 2,000 years of examples of how God can use one person, quite literally, not only to reflect Jesus, but to change the world. Okay? Um, your book has some examples in it uh, that, that we mentioned a couple of them. People who, even if they died young, had significant power. I want to mention just a couple of ones that are very important to me. Okay, Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr was Martyr, which is where he gets that name, in 166. Justin Martyr was one of the group called the Christian Apologists. He is one who defended the Christian church against all of the accusations being made against it by the Roman Empire in order to try to fend off some of the persecution, some of the persecution that he ended up being a victim of. Um, but he, he was one of the most brilliant early Christians in terms of his defense of the truth of the gospel against not only these accusations, but some of his works are still some of the most important works ever written. So philosopher, apologist, Christian martyr. At his death, he said this, we desire nothing more than to suffer for our Lord Jesus Christ, for this gives us salvation and joyfulness before his dreadful judgment seat. And he recognized his own failing and the judgment that was coming. When he says it gives us salvation, I think what he was saying is that as opposed to us renouncing Jesus, 
denying him in the face of his persecution. A great man of God, a brilliant, you know, genius in his writing, who ended up as a martyr, one of the, you know, quite early on. Uh, who murdered him? The Romans. The Romans. Yeah. Um, Martin Luther, okay, I'm not a Lutheran, but that's okay. <laughs> Luther started the Protestant Reformation. When he was, um, Luther did not want him to stop being a Catholic. He did not want to create a rift in the church. He just wanted the Catholic Church to stop doing all these horrible things they were doing. You know, that were clearly, he felt, not according to Scripture, not according to God's will. And he challenged them on it. And they kept saying, shut up, Marty. And he kept saying, no, I'm not going to shut up. This is important. This is an issue of are we obedient to God or are we doing what our own selfish desires want? And ultimately, in 1521, he was called to the Diet of Worms. Why would anybody want to go to something called the Diet of Worms? Okay? A diet is a formal gathering. Okay? And it was held in Worms in Germany. And he, he came before the emperor. And the emperor, who was very Catholic at that point, said, renounce recant what you said about the Catholic Church, and we'll let you go. But otherwise, you are under penalty of death. We will declare you excommunicated, a heretic. You will be burned at the stake. And so he's standing there before papal representatives and the emperor, and his final statement was, when they said, you must recant or die, he said, I cannot and will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe, he means against conscience what God has told me. And that's not safe because you don't defy God when he has made it clear to you what's true. Here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God, amen. Well that night, he's leaving Worms before they arrest him, and he is swooped up by, um, by men who are working for Frederick of Saxony, who is a, uh, a, a local uh, royalty, and because Wittenberg, which is where the cathedral was that, that uh, Luther had nailed the theses up, and Wittenberg University, Wittenberg University had been founded by Frederick. And even though Frederick was a Catholic, he never actually became a Protestant. He was very sympathetic to what Luther was saying. He thought the church needed to change, and he certainly didn't want anybody messing around with his school and his town. So they grabbed Luther up, took him, to, off to a castle in hiding, and over the next year, Luther translated the Latin Bible into German. And in doing so, he not only provided the scripture in the language of the common people, but he invented modern German, because his translation became the basis for, if you've ever heard Old German, Old German is to modern German what Old English is to modern English. All the these and thous and saiths and blah, blah, blah. Well, Luther invented modern German as well as providing scripture in the common language. He, and he, he was the fire that started the Protestant Reformation. And he did so, one person changing the world for Christ. William Tyndale, Tyndale actually at one point went to meet, to see Luther. And as Tyndale was working on an English translation of the Bible, Tyndale was frequently persecuted, frequently on the run finally is captured in Belgium. And his whole, I mean, he, he had worked very hard to grow and build the church in England. He was English. But he was on the continent because he was under penalty of death for trying to defy the Catholic Church in England and for writing that, you know, they believed that it was a sin to provide scripture in a common language because they thought priests, the people of the church, had to translate it because lay people would get it wrong. So they considered it a sin, a violation of the church's law provide the scripture in a common language. Tyndale continued to do that. He wrote, he finally had 3,000 copies of his English Bible smuggled into England. Of those, only three of them survived and only one of them is complete. But his translation, even though he was captured, he was taken back to England, he was martyred, burned at the stake. First he was garroted and then burned at the stake. And at his death, his last words were not condemnation for those people who had done this, but rather he said, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Well, a short time after that, they accepted the English Bible. And in fact, you've probably heard people say that the King James Bible, which came, came in, the, in the 1600s, you know, so we're talking 
less than 100 years after this, people have said that Shakespeare greatly influenced the King James Bible. 91% of the King James Bible is directly taken from the Tyndale Bible, 91%. What happened was Tyndale, and Tyndale did for English not quite as much, but almost as much as um, Luther did for German. Tyndale influenced Shakespeare, and then Shakespeare influenced the King James Bible. He changed the world in a very real way. And one of my very favorites is William Wilberforce. Wilberforce was an English man, he was uh, an Englishman who was a member of parliament as a young man, very young man, and in his mid-twenties, he became a Christian. And he committed himself, he wasn't sure if he should still be in politics, and some close friends of his, William Pitt, you know, from which we get the name Pittsburgh, who, who was the Prime Minister of England after that, they were good friends, convinced him, no, we need godly people in politics too, and so he stayed in parliament. In 1787, after much prayer and consideration through the influence of some friends, William Wilberforce wrote in his diary, God Almighty has set before me two great objectives, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of manners. And by manners, he means moral values. At this time, slavery in the British colonies, and well, all of Britain, um, was horrendous. 10% of all the African slaves that were captured and to take to the New World, 10 more than 10% of them died in route. If you've ever seen diagrams of the slaver ships, they, they have diagrams of them that show how slaves were to be laid down, as many of them as you could stack in these ships for the voyage across the Atlantic Ocean. And again, 1.4 million of those slaves died en route. Um, the first thing they did was to abolish the slave trade, which means they couldn't buy and sell slaves. But slavery still existed for the slaves that were already there. Later on, just three days before his death, Wilberforce, who was the primary driving effort the person behind getting rid of the slave trade in, in great, the British colonies, just three days before his death, the vote came down to abolish slavery entirely. And this was this was you know when we still had slavery in the United States, this was actually um, you know the still the colonial days. He also, when you think when he says the reformation of moral values, in his day. Morality in Britain was horrendous. Prostitution, pornography, vice, drunkenness. It was awful. You could not walk down the streets of any city without being molested. Um, you know, it was a horrendous thing. Well, Wilberforce and his associates, the Clapham Senate, campaigned and campaigned and campaigned, both to take legal action against those people like, like the, you know, the houses of prostitution and pornographers and everything else, by the time he died, Britain, the moral circumstance in Britain had changed. In fact, it was immediately after that we entered into the Victorian period. And, you know, the Victorian period is known, maybe too much, for its moral statements, its moral, you know, its moral concerns. They went from the most unbelievably corrupt and evil and awful country in the world to Victorianism. And yeah, I think they went a little too far. But the idea is they made Wilberforce and those folks to have changed the world. So we have those examples. Okay. I'm going to go for about 10 more minutes probably, and then you guys will be free to go for the day. So any questions about that? And I could go on. I mean, we could put a thousand examples up here of people like that. All of the martyrs, all of the great people of the faith. Yes? Uh, the movie uh, Amazing Grace. Uh, do you feel that it follows the life of Wilberforce fairly well? I have not seen it. I just purchased it a week ago. Yeah, so we have it, you know, we, we it have the digital good. version of it, so we can watch it sometime. Yeah. Uh, but I do know that Eric Metaxas, who wrote the book on which the movie is based, mm -hmm. is a good scholar and a very committed Christian. And so I'm saying I trust Eric, but I, you know, I haven't seen the movie. Okay? But uh, if, you're, if you're interested in this kind of theme, the Texas also has another book called Seven Men, uh, and, and the source of their greatness, I think it is. And he looks at, he, he recently wrote a biography of Dietrich Bonhoeffer that's very popular. He looks at Bonhoeffer, Wilberforce, and five other men, and all of them Christians, committed Christians, and what they did, how, how they affected things, and their faith being the source of their greatness. Seven Men. Seven Men. That's just the title, and then the subtitle is, and the source of their greatness, or something. If you look up... 
Eric Metaxas, M-E-T-A-X-E-X, -E -E I think that's right, Metaxas, the E-S, you'll find it, seven minutes. I saw him speaking on a video, and he commented on Wilberforce in the movie, and he said the movie touched, the movie touched only a small part of what he actually did. Sure. So, but he seemed to be saying it was, you know, it was true, but it just wasn't full enough. Hey, yeah, how much can you get? I mean, he worked, he worked at this for full 50 years, okay? Yeah. Um, it's also true, and I, in, the, in the spirit of fairness, which you appreciate, that after World War IV died, his two sons wrote a biography of their father, and in it, they pretty much gave Wilbur Force full credit for having gotten rid of the slave trade. Well, there's another man who was the one who actually had visited the colonies and had seen the trade, you know, visited where the slaves were being taken and everything else. And he and Wilbur Force had been very close friends. And without him, this probably wouldn't have happened. They really were partners in this. And he really kind of, he took exception to the fact that his sons had said, wait a minute, you know, you said he's entirely responsible. We were dear friends and we worked together for 50 years with on this. I think I should at least get a little more mention. And his sons apologized. And in subsequent printings, they changed it to give this person. So when it was pointed out to them, they, they made the effort to try to correct the problem. Mm -hmm. okay. But there, are, there were other people involved. It wasn't just him, but he clearly was the driving force behind it, the one that they looked to for leadership. And the one who was in Parliament, who actually moved to get the laws passed and things like that. OK? Um, so. The question is, how do we actually do this? How do we influence others for Christ? Some of the things I've already touched on, but I want to get into it. Ultimately, um, I want to give you some sort of five points of how we influence others as Christians. Ultimately, we need to recognize that we influence others more by what we are than by what we say or do. Now, the point is, though, that what we are, it's reflected in what we say and do. Now, if we're having problems with how it looks, then probably we need to not worry about so much about how it looks as from what source does that come? You know, so we need to be concerned about ourselves being changed, and ourselves being different, and seeking to become more holy, you know, to become more sanctified, more in the spirit that Christ wants of us. Um, <clears throat> well, and, and I'll quote a scripture verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 15 and 16. Paul says, For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, both believers and unbelievers. To the one, an aroma from death to death. To the other, an aroma from life to life. And who is adequate to these things? This is bigger than me. Even Paul said, I'm not adequate to this. And yet he said, as being an aroma of Christ, an example to unbelievers, they can see that they're not where they need to be. And that's what he means by from an aroma from death to death. That they can recognize that they are falling short and need to change. For Christians to be encouraged, an aroma from life to life. Okay. Very powerful verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 15, 16. So, how do we influence others? First, by how we treat others. We have to reflect good to people and not evil. This comes back to how we make people feel. What do we say to them? How do we act to them? John 13, 35, this is the, you know, uh, those who are being saved part. By this everyone will know you're my disciples if you love one another. And then that extends to loving others. If we stop short only with loving other Christians, we've missed it. But that's the start, the idea of having love. Secondly, we influence others by how we speak. What do we say? 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. You don't go to a concert by the Indigo Girls, where there are a lot of lesbian, lesbians with public shows of affection on the sidewalk and jump out of your cars and hold up signs that say homosexual, they're going to burn in hell. I don't think that's the definition of gentleness and respect. And yet Carolyn and I experienced that, didn't we, Carol? Mm -hmm. um, and that sort of thing happens all the time. I'm right. I'm good. You're wrong. You're bad. Let me point that out to you. No, that's not how we speak. That's not how we relate to other people. We are supposed to explain, and, and I've said many times, witnessing is not, let me tell you what's wrong with you. Let me tell you how you need to change. Let me tell you what you need to do. No. Point your finger in the other direction. Witnessing is, let me tell you what God has done for me. 
Let me tell you what Jesus means to me. Let me tell you how I've been changed. Let me tell you how my life is different. That's what witnessing is. Okay, Lynn? I think one of the most profound experiences I had was at Costco. <coughs> Excuse me. It yeah. happens to be all the time. <laughs> <laughs> was at Costco. 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 Um, two Mexican ladies who had no English um, were sharing a table, and there was no space for me anywhere except there. So I asked if I could join them. And I sat down with my drink, and the two ladies said almost simultaneously, do you know Jesus? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes. And they said, is there anybody we can pray for? Um, and you know, this was right. their faith in action. Not tell me your story or, or anything like that. Is there anybody we can pray for? Right. And at that time, I had somebody who was in real psychological and physical um, bad streets. And they prayed at length with such fervor and love that I felt, and they gave me hugs as I met. They said, you drive really careful because you have a long way. Now, my Spanish is not good, but I was given the ability to understand what they were saying, both because it was so loving and so respectful, uh, but because it was so genuine. Good. Yeah. Marvin? 35 years ago, when I was really discouraged with the church, um, I had a meeting, and I said, I don't, I see us using so many of these films about the end of the world and the rapture coming, and we're trying to scare people to fear God so they become Christians. As I'm saying to them, I think the love of God has got a lot of power. You know, that God's love is what we should be doing, not scare people. Yeah. Well, I think I think you're absolutely right. In fact, if we read the great sermons of you know Peter and Stephen and everybody else in the New Testament, it is presenting the love of Jesus and what He has done for us that are the great evangelistic sermons. It's not now. The fact is, and you've heard me say this a little in this class, the recognition that hell is real and that it is a place for those who reject Jesus. We can't sort of we can't whitewash that, but that's not our primary message. You know, that, that comes in chapter 9. That's not chapter 1 in terms of how we communicate. It is a fact. But that's not that's not what you lead with. Absolutely. And I hope that's been your experience here. It's different than that. Absolutely. So. You're, you're drawn by love, and then you can, you can love yourself as well because you see it in others, and you respond, and you work that way. When people don't uh, become Christians and want to follow God because they're so afraid of it. Right. <laughs> Want to call him because he loves them so much. Right, and sometimes we we skew things. Um, Jonathan Edwards, I, in high school, in our high school literature book, they had the sermon "Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God" by Jonathan Edwards, and so which is a is a powerful sermon about condemnation and about you know the the those who do not accept him will be condemned, um, you know like spiders on a web hanging over a fire kind of stuff, and it's just like scary stuff. Well, I remember that I and everybody else came away with the idea that, man, this dude was ticked off and mean. Well, you know what? I found out later, Jonathan Edwards was the most significant, is the most significant philo um, theologian ever produced in the New World. Jonathan Edwards is the primary American theologian since the founding of America. His doctrines are sound. He, you know, his, he has servants full of light and Goodness, that's just one sermon that he preached in one circumstance, and yet that made it into the literature books, and that's what everybody thinks about. And I'm sure that there are still people this day that think that Jonathan Edwards is the perfect example of this hateful, mean, spiteful, awful, going to hell kind of preacher, and that's not who he was. Sometimes you need to preach that sermon, but that's not what you need. Okay. All right, by how we speak. Then by how we act, how uh, and, and this includes how people see us live our lives. You know, what, how, how are we going about our lives? They see that from a distance as well as how we act immediately in front of them and towards them. First Peter 1 Peter 1:15 and 16. But just as he has called you to be holy, so be holy in all you do, for it is written, "Be holy, because I am holy." This involves our choices. Are we making choices that are Choices that God approves of, that are righteously motivated, that are honoring to God. Now these two things together, how we speak and how we act, they have to be in sync. 
We say the right things and do the wrong things, or we say the right things and then don't do those things, then we are hypocrites. And hypocrites do not generate positive influence. Okay? Hypocrisy does not influence people in the way we want to go. It's quite the contrary. You can be a detrimental influence if you demean the name of Christ. I know this is one of Carolyn's big, strong, strong issues, that people who in the name of Christ do things that simply are terrible, like signs that say, you know, you're going to burn in hell forever. You, they are demeaning the name of Christ. They are defacing the glory of God. We have to be honest, but loving in what we say, consistent and honest and loving in how we act. If we are not, then we will be held accountable for that. Okay? So, how we treat others, how we speak, how we act, and then by what we stand for. And by what we stand for, that also, that also includes who we associate with, and where we go, and what we do when we get there. Now, that's not to say you're never supposed to associate with anybody who's not a believer. I think we should. I think we should have unbelieving friends with the prayerful hope that they will see something in us, and they will hear something from us that will lead them to be people of faith. So I'm not saying don't associate with people you know, don't, that aren't believers. But if every night you're hanging out at the bar with a very rough crowd and doing the, the things that that very rough crowd is doing and saying the things that very rough crowd is saying, then you probably are not influencing people in the right way because you're not being clear in what you stand for. Jesus in Matthew 10 said, Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. What we stand for, in my experience, and again, I'm an introvert. I am not somebody who gets on an airplane going, wow, I'm going to have a chance to share Jesus with somebody. <laughs> Much more likely, I get on an airplane and I say, please, God, don't make that person, talk. don't let that person talk to me, okay? <laughs> it is who I am, and, it's, and it's, I'm sure it's part of a brokenness in me, but I'm being very honest about that. And yet, I, I have to be clear what I stand for. Um, and I have been surprised that the number of times in the course of a conversation that I will say I'm a Christian or with Cliffy when I say I believe there's a force of evil in the world, the devil. I mean, I told him I was, he knew I was a pastor. We've already talked about that. Um, in my experience, that the reaction we're always afraid is going to happen almost never happens. Now, it could. But instead, people usually are sufficiently surprised. They go... Wow, really? Tell me about that. I've had that happen any number of times. Um, where, well, you know, in a, in a hostel, a youth hostel in Israel, where a Jewish fellow says, it's all my Bible, so you're a Christian. I said, yeah. I'm in Israel, this guy's Jewish. Let's go have a cup of coffee. I want to talk to you about that. Sometimes people want to meet someone who, as long as they're respectful, stand for something. They respect the fact that, that somebody can have beliefs, that we're not just another one of these wishy-washy, you know, mush-minded kind of go through the world. That we can be loving and we can be generous with them, but we can be clear. This is what I believe. This is what God has done for me. Mark? I'll fill up the Ethiopian eunuch. You know, yep. I wish I knew somebody who could explain this to me. He says, I can. Yeah, <laughs> I can help you that. Okay. So, what we stand for. Sometimes... People just want to know somebody who stands for something, and we can be that. And then, how we deal with opposition and adversity. There's perhaps no other single thing that has been more influential in the 2,000 years of the church than when, during times of persecution, Christians have, how they've dealt with the persecution, how they have dealt with it without hate. I just read an account of a Chinese officer in the Chinese army, who had been responsible for arresting and executing a number of Christians. And later on, he went secretly, this came out much later, he went to a Christian pastor that he heard about and said, I need to ask you a question. I personally have been responsible for the arrest and the execution of a number of Christians. And they all have such peace. Why is that? How we deal with adversity, 
with opposition, even with outright persecution, can be a critical way in which we influence people. Okay? Romans 12 says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. We don't get back at people. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. It's not saying do whatever anybody wants you to do. If it's possible within the context of our own Christian walk, then we need to live at peace with people. We're not, we're not looking to pick a fight. Scripture says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I used to play racquetball with a guy. He was a great racquetball player, much better than me. And when I first started learning the game, from time, did you play racquetball? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, whoever's in the backboard hitting the ball, between them and the wall that the ball is going to is the other player. <laughs> And if somebody doesn't know what they're doing, then it's fairly common to hit the other player with the ball. Which is fine if you're, you know, wimpy about it, but if you hit it hard, I've seen people's legs turn yellow and, and purple with bruises from racquetballs. Or have this elongated oval where the ball flattened out on their legs and this huge bruise. Well, my friend Paul, uh, who was old, much older than I was, much better player, you know, I, I hit him a couple of times one day and I said, oh, I'm really sorry, you know, he said, that's all right. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. <laughs> and I said, but it says, thus saith the Lord. He said, I ain't quoting that part. <laughs> well, for many of us, we have that attitude. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Full stop, period. No. Says the Lord. We leave that to him. Matthew 5, Jesus said, You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your Father in heaven. One of the characteristics of being one of the children of God is that we pray for our enemies. We don't hate our enemies. Brothers and sisters, this is hard, especially when your enemies are hard-bitten against you. It's hard enough for me when people say mean things to me as, you know, as pastor. And you'd be surprised some of the things he said to me, wouldn't they, Carolyn? It's <laughs> crazy. Um, that's hard, and yet I, you know, after after the sting is off, I don't I don't hold it against them. I don't not talk to them. I don't, you know, they're not my enemies. I don't hate them. I may still be frustrated with them and sometimes because I'll do it again next week or the week after that. But you know, we have to learn not to hold those grudges, not to hate, not to look for opportunities to get back at them or make them feel bad or make them feel when they mean you feel. That's not what we do. And yeah, you can be frustrated, and yeah, you can pour it all out with your spouse and say, ah! But then we go on, and we forgive, and we love them, and we work with them. And we have to learn to be like those Chinese Christians who were arrested and executed, whose demeanor and attitude was such that the executioner is motivated to say, how can they have such peace? Now, this, is, this has been true throughout the history of the church. Number of, a number of times there have been revivals that, have, that happened in the Roman world. You know, people, other people coming to Christians and wanting to become Christians because of seeing how the Christians acted in the, in the Colosseum, for instance. We know of those cases. Um, so, so this is how we are to be influencers for God. Any questions about any of that? Margaret? Just I reminded always of, of David before he was king when he was being persecuted by Saul. You know, he loved Jonathan, he loved Saul and he fled and he had opportunity to take take the sword in his own hand and kill his enemy and I mean I'm going to be king so I might as well go ahead and do that but he would not yeah and God did his vengeance plus that yeah twice actually once when when Saul was in a cave using the bathroom and David was in the cave back behind him and he cut off the corner of his robe to just prove later I could have killed you then and then later Saul was asleep in the camp and David and you know, others snuck into camp. And you know, took some of his stuff in order to show him. You know, we could have killed you at any time, but David refused to. And in fact, um, David always maintained that anyone who touched the anointing one of God, even if God had removed that anointing, that there would be judgment on. And Saul had so many opportunities to repent and would not. Well, and he did repent often, and then yeah. repented of his repentance. <laughs> yes. you know? In those cases, he apologized. David, you are righteous, and I am not. I am so sorry. The next day, he's after him again. All right. Thank you, folks. That's